If you have recently watched 1990 horror thriller Jacob's Ladder, you might have come to similar conclusion as I did. This movie would work in a vacuum. In this instance, vacuum means a world where no other movies exist. That's how overused its ending twist is. The main character was dead all along. Or it was all a dream, or a simulation, those sorts. He's probably experiencing some kind of it-was-all-a-dream type hallucination as his brain dies. The grandfather of all the protagonists was dead slash dreaming slash in a simulation actually stories has to be Philip K. Dick's Ubik. It might not be the first ever, but it has the most meaningful legacy, even for those who never opened the actual book or even heard about it. What's Ubik? Well, I do have this completely edited summary with Futurama clips, so it would be silly not to use it. One of Dick's most beloved novels begins with establishing a world where the dead don't just die, but are put in a half-life. A virtual reality from which they can be awakened for finite times to have discussions with the relatives who pay for the upkeep. Those in Half-Life eventually begin to control the virtual world they inhabit. In Ubik, those in Half-Life aren't always in complete control over their worlds. A kid named Jori, who's in Half-Life 2, intrudes to other Half-Lives and messes them up in order of consuming their poor souls. When even he can't keep the worlds together, time starts to slip. Our hero, Joe Chip, who in this moment doesn't yet know he's in Half-Life, might jump in a plane built in 2000 and jump away from it in 1950s, if there's a plane left. There is a reason why Joe spends a while in his Half-Life without really knowing it. He thinks he's been in an explosion that killed his boss but left all others unharmed. But it's the other way around. His boss, Runcifer, is the only one who survives. That's the twist that Joe found out in the last act. Ubik is a spray inside the half-life that keeps you from deteriorating and protects from the consuming preteen. In the end, Joe eventually learns to control his virtual environment. Good thing I made that long ago. Dick has said that Ubik is an analog for God, but I do not think that's too relevant right now. Multiple efforts have been made to create a movie adaptation of Ubik, but that production never went anywhere. Even in 2010s it was still being worked, like the movie was in some sort of pre-life purgatory. That, uh, well, seems fitting. Now we are so far removed from the novel's original publication, that a straight-up movie adaptation of a story where the main theme is human mind's inability to differentiate between simulated reality and the real world seems pointless. World has now seen this trope enough that I rolled my eyes when existence did it. And that was in the 90s. Or maybe it could have been made to something more. Latest director who had been working on new big movie in 2010s was Michael Gondry director of Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which is basically the exact opposite of We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, the anti-Total Recall. Interestingly though, 1974 Dick was asked to write a screenplay for Ubik himself. His vision was that the half-life world's deterioration to the past would be shown by quality of the picture reverting to like movies of the olden days. Quote, film itself would appear to undergo a series of reversions, to black and white, then to the awkward jerkiness of the very early movies, then to a crookedly jammed frame which proceeds to blacken, bubble and melt away leaving only the white glare of the projection bulb. This is almost a decade before Blade Runner saw the light of day and defined Dick's legacy, but for his first film, Phil wanted to go for the same sort of meta piss take as Joe Dante would make in Gremlins 2. I do kinda love that. So the movie was never made. The trope remained and evolved, and now we reach the year 2020 and Gavin Rothery's archive. 
archive has nothing to do with Ubik in that same kind of way that Steven Universe has nothing to do with Theodore Sturgeon. We follow George. He's trying to create a perfect human-like AI in Japan in the year 2038, alone, with his only companions being these robots he created. Like Mystery Science Theater 3000, where we have removed color and jokes and fun and everything. Okay, maybe the movie is really easiest to describe as a cross between Ex Machina and Moon. I'm surely not the first person to make this comparison. The, the director-writer actually played a major part in production of Moon. Before describing anything more about the plot, I have to tell you how Archive very unapologetically borrows from Ubik. Dead people can be put into a half-life where they can have conversations beyond the grave as long as someone pays to keep their consciousness alive. Archived clients can expect up to 200 hours of face-to-face -face interaction with the deceased. I mean, you get to wrap up your affairs after you're dead. You get to say goodbye properly. I wouldn't know I was dead, right? How'd you know you would anyway? George's wife is in half-life. She died in a car crash. And I have to spoil everything already, I'm really sorry, but anyways, George was the one driving. It's really him who died. This world is all in his head. Yes, even the ending twist is the exact same, just not, at, not as hopeful. George's story ends when the plug is pulled. Almost everything that happens to George during the story gives us hints that he might actually be the dead one. His main objective is to create that perfect AI. Well, you're all an attempt at the same thing. Deep tiered machine learning, artificial intelligence, and human equivalence, the holy grail. Here, machine learning towards the human equivalence works like childhood. George's third creation, J3, seems like a complete person. Previous prototypes, J1 and J2, are mentally like 5 and 15 year olds. Does this make sense? Do you buy that this James Franco Holden could create these things himself? Maybe not. But when you consider all the guilt and trauma because he thinks he killed his pregnant wife, it makes perfect sense that he's basically constructing wife and kids for himself. It's like the ending to Total Recall. It only has to make sense to this one guy who buys all this because his brain might be melting in the real world. If that's not enough guilt, he could have prevented the car crash by letting the car drive itself. And his wife never wanted to be put in this half-life, but George put her in it anyway. Other clues come to us as we see every other human he interacts with. When he wants to reach his half-living wife, he rarely succeeds. This makes sense because the connection is there only when his wife Julia actually wants to contact him. Julia has decided not to tell George about his death. I don't know why. It might be just for the audience. George's boss is this one-dimensional stereotype who just wants profits to smash through the roof. Except for that ugly thing. It really would be such a pity if you couldn't deliver. Arts and robotics research isn't really the future of this company. My prototypes sail through the Haldeman test. I mean, that thing doesn't even speak. Toby Jones and his associates arrive to repair George's somnolent unit. This monolith of a fridge contains the mind of his wife, and they want to take it away. So, of course, their dress code is one hat shy away from being SS officers. Although it does confuse me a little that these dudes are still dressed as Wolf Brigade even in the real world, so pretend you never saw that. Then there's this guy. His existence basically only makes sense because George really feels his story requires an antagonist. I'm a risk assessor. I assess risk. And you... <laughs> Our risk. I'm very sorry. You cannot smoking. I hope, for your sake, 
I don't need to use this in the next couple of minutes. He explains how George needs protection because some evil forces are after him. Why? Who? How? Are the stakes really that high? I don't know and it doesn't matter. Risk Assessor is what you could call a hardcore version of an insurance agent. So I'm completely on board on why you would see such leech epitomized as this early access cyberpunk reject. Damn insurance companies, like why would you decide that I'm not going to receive 10 grand if Tilda Swinton dies? Sure, I only paid one hundredth of that, but have you no concept of emotional value? You bastard! How could you? What did she ever do to you? Do you kiss your mother with that gun? Tangent over. If Ubik the chemical was meant to represent God, that's the thing that's easiest to remove from this story. But George is trying to become a god in his own right. He has managed to hack into the somnolent half-life fridge monolith and succeeded to extract what is basically a copy of his wife's mind and memories. This is what he has used as a starting point in building J1, 2 and now 3. He has brought his wife back from the dead, in a way I have to assume was inspired by We Can Build You. I haven't actually spoiled this movie completely from you. You can still watch it if you don't want to just know useless trivia, but want to feel actual emotions. When the story ends, George's obsession has started to manifest in ways that might be morally dubious. How would I put this? What if Janeway decided to murder Neelix and Tuvik just so we could get a new copy of Tuvix. Not spoiling things is hard. So about that ending, remember what I said about Dick's own screenplay idea? Terrible film quality and the movie just melts? George, don't answer it. This is the last time I'll be able to speak. They're telling me your system's going to expire. I think this is pretty loyal to that idea. But what I think works even better here is the world surrounding George's workshop. No matter if it's covered in snow or not, the outside world remains almost completely black and white. My first thought when witnessing the ending twist was that maybe the outside world was able to render just so much. In my opinion, this story about family was a better story than Ubik. And I don't think that's too much of a slander against PKD. Archive is more complete than Ubik. It kinda has to be. Here's what writer-director Gavin Rothery had done during the years leading up to Archive according to IMDb. And here's the list of novels Philip K. Dick wrote during the three years leading to Ubik in 1966. This was his most productive period. Idea! Use it. Done. Next. Archive wasn't made in such rush. Its creators weren't planning on releasing another story the following week. There was time to add more than the bare minimum. Change. Control. Partner. Lives. Gavin Rothery managed to take one idea from Dick, well maybe one and a half, and refine it to a fine spiritual successor to Ubik. I mean, it's closer to Ubik than Natural City is to do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Anyone else saw that Korean Blade Runner? No? Well, it's closer to Ubik than Total Recall was to We Can Remember It For You Wholesale after the first half an hour. Dick had a lot of ideas, and that translated to a lot of books and stories. You can overwhelm yourself if you try to cram more than two of his twists into a single narrative. Our hero was dead all along. 
is one of numerous twist endings Dick sprinkled around his stories. There are loads of instances in these stories where the world wasn't what it seemed. Like, the main character was hunting for a robot, but he was that robot all along. The main character was only a brain in a jar that was given religious visions just for the lulls. The main character had implanted memories to make everything in their past a mystery. The apocalyptic war ended long ago and life returned, but some people were never told about it. The main character was living in a constructed bubble of ancient past while unknowingly taking part in war games of the humans of real world. The main character learns that everyone can be rebuilt as an android, so convincing that there is never a way to be sure who is human. One person's mind can spread to everyone's body. The future was correctly predicted by simulating hundreds of possible paths. That's just a fraction of all the twists and turns you can find among Dick's works. Now try to think of a story that uses all of those. What a nonsensical mountain of nothingness that would be! So then there's that. Why is Westworld so stupid? Okay, we kinda all know why. It's a series where the showrunners had ideas for one season, but they kept doing more anyways. Now they've gone through season 4. This series is a perfect example how, of how bad you can screw everything when playing with these twists and ideas. Westworld started as a story about androids reaching sentience in a theme park. During the fourth season, we have established following technologies all being used in its world. Fake memories can be implanted to androids and humans. Dead and living humans can be replicated infinite times. Android sentiences can be copied to multiple bodies. Consciousnesses of androids can be trapped into a loop where they relive the same simulated events when really they are just a ball on a shelf. Consciousnesses of humans can be trapped into androids that can be trapped into a loop where they die again and again and again. Supercomputers can predict the fate of the entire world. Humans and androids can be easily forced to do anything with a push of a button. Virtual simulations are indistinguishable from real world and can be run infinite times to reach a desired outcome. When all that is possible, can you care what happens? I mean, the series is basically flipping the bird to you and saying you are not allowed to care. Take any scene with any characters. Is this a meaningful scene? These two can both be in a simulation. Or only one of them can be. Or they might be talking about something the other just thinks happened but is a fake memory. Either one can be anyone because anyone can be in the body of anyone else. They might both kill each other without a warning because someone pushed a button. This might happen decades into the future and one of them is a clone that was just created. If both of them die, it doesn't matter because they might have been copies among hundreds of copies and so forth. All these possibilities are just as likely as any other. What a delightful result. It's impossible to give an inkling of a flying fuck. Nothing can matter. Add this to having showrunners that like to do twists that they think will leave the audience amazed. If you have no idea what's happening, it might not mean that the series is smart. I don't think it's just me. This series is kind of... well... It is shit, Austin. Oh good, then it's not just me.